God is the God of fresh starts, new beginnings, and second chances. God is the God of glory days. And if you could use some, then welcome to Glory Days, a series of lessons on the book and life of Joshua. God gave him and the Hebrews a promised land life, and he offers to do the same for you. If you're interested, then receive what he has to give. Let's begin with the Glory Days Declaration. The words will appear on the screen. I want you to please fill your lungs with air and your hearts with hope and say it like you mean it. These days are glory days. My past is past. My future is bright. God's promises are true. His word is sure. With God as my helper, I will be all he wants me to be, do all he wants me to do, and receive all he wants me to receive. These days are glory days. Yes, they are, Lord. They're not easy days. They're not always pleasant days. But they are, Father, days in which we can sense your power and your presence and your promise. Today we lean into those. So many voices have competed for your attention. And we have heeded them, Lord. Today we heed yours. Would you please instill within us fresh hope embed within us a new truth and convict us, Father, that you are calling us into a new land. Find that soul among us that today came with so much discouragement and despair that they barely made it. Would you speak to them? And now, Lord, forgive the sins of the one who speaks. There are so many. And grant that we can see Christ, our Savior. In his name we pray. And all the church said, well, people in Paraguay are making music with their trash. They're turning wash tubs into kettle drums, plastic hoses into trumpets. Other orchestras fine-tune their mahogany cellos and brass tubas, but not this band. The kids from Cartura, Paraguay, have found a way to play Beethoven sonatas, with plastic buckets. Credit a man by the name of Don Cola. He's a garbage picker who lives in the shack beside the town dump. On his side of Ansuncion, the garbage is the only crop to harvest. He and thousands like him sort and sell refuse for 10 cents a pound. They are the poorest of Paraguay's poor. In many ways, they have met the same fate as the trash. They've been tossed out. They've been discarded. But Cola is bringing music their way. He had never seen, held, or heard a violin in his life. Yet when someone described the instrument to him, this untutored craftsman took a paint can and an oven tray into his tiny workshop and he made a violin. His next project was a cello. He fashioned the body out of an oil barrel and made tuning knobs out of a hairbrush, the heel of a shoe, and a wooden spoon. Thanks to this trash dump Stradivarius, the junk gets a mulligan. And so do the kids who live among it. They're playing the instruments. And ever since their story hit the news, they've been tutored by world-class maestros and featured on national television programs. Why, they've even gone on a world tour. You can call them the Landfill Harmonic, the Second Chance Symphony, or the Recycled Orchestra. Or you might call them a picture of God's grace. He sure can make music out of riffraff, can't he? Heaven's orchestra right now is composed of the unlikeliest of musicians. There's Peter playing the trumpet. He's the one who cursed the name of the Christ who saved him. There's Paul. He plays the violin. There was a day when he played the self-righteous religious thug. (laughs) And the guy on the harp, David. Bloodthirsty David. Conniving David. Adulterous, David. Murderous, David. Repentant, David. But we turn our attention today to the lady on the clarinet. Her name is Rahab. And we begin by pointing out her profession. 
Rahab's profession in Jericho. Here's your cue if you like to fill in the blanks. Rahab's profession in Jericho. Her story appears in the second chapter of Joshua, verse 1. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. And so they went. And they came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. So the time has come for the Hebrew people to cross over into the new promised land. Joshua was their leader, if you remember, and Jericho is their first challenge. It was a formidable town that sat on the north of the Dead Sea, just across the banks of the Jordan River. Canaanites indwelt the city of Jericho. We'll be talking quite a bit about Canaanites, but for today, suffice it to say, to call the people barbaric is to describe the North Pole as nippy. <laughs> Some sociologists have said the world has not seen a more evil people since these people of Canaan. They sacrificed their own children in worship. Worship was an orgy, literally. They buried babies alive. Canaanites, it seemed, had no regard for human life. They had no respect for God. And so it was into this city that these two spies of Joshua crept, and it was into this city that these two spies met Rahab, the harlot. We could say much about Rahab without mentioning her profession. And she was a Canaanite. She covered, provided cover for the spies in Joshua. She believed, as you'll read, in the God of Abraham. Having never met the children of Abraham, she was spared the destruction of her city. She was grafted into the Hebrew culture. She married a contemporary of Joshua. She bore a son named Boaz. She had a grandson named Jesse, a great-grandson named David, and one of her descendants was named Jesus Christ. Yes, Rahab's name appears on the family tree of the Son of God. Rahab's resume could mention much without mentioning her profession. Yet in five out of seven appearances of her name in Scripture, there it is, Rahab the harlot. Five. I'm thinking one would be enough. And that one reference could be cloaked in a vague, obscure Hebrew term like Rahab the best hostess <laughs> in Jericho. Rahab who made everyone feel welcome. Just kind of cover it up a bit. A little cover up on this biblical blemish. It's bad enough that Rahab sounds like rehab. <laughs> Just drop the reference to the brothel, please. But the Bible doesn't. Just the opposite. The Bible makes a big deal out of it. God even included Rahab's name and profession in the book of Hebrews Hall of Fame. The list includes Abel and Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses. And then all of a sudden, Rahab the harlot. No asterisk, no apology, no footnote, just right there, living color for all to see. It is as if God is making a point about the people he uses. He's been known to turn some rejects into music makers, too. So back to the story. Rahab's profession in Jericho mattered less then than Rahab's profession of faith. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to spy out the country. If you've heard the other messages, you might remember that the number of Hebrews on the other side of the Jordan was significant. Anyone remember? 
Well over two million. You don't hide two million people, especially when you're only six to eight miles away. The king could see them. Everyone could see them. And as Rahab will later disclose, all the people of Jericho were scared. Word on the street was that God had his hand on this Hebrew people, and woe be to anyone who got in their way. When the kings heard that the spies were hiding at Rahab's house, he sent soldiers to fetch them. And the result is, I think, one of the most fascinating scenes in the book of Joshua. I'm envisioning half a dozen soldiers squeezing down those narrow cobblestoned streets through and into the red light district of Jericho. It's late at night and the torch lit taverns are open and the patrons are already a few sheets to the wind. They yell obscenities at the king's men but the Soldiers don't react. The guards are on a mission. They keep walking. They keep walking. They keep walking until finally they stand before the wooden door of a stone building that abuts the famous Jericho walls. Its lantern is unlit, leaving the soldiers to wonder if anyone is at home. The captain pounds on the door. Pound, pound, pound. There's a shuffling inside. The door opens, and there she is, Rahab, the madam. Rahab. Her low-cut robe reveals a fringe that a lacy secret had to it that even Victoria couldn't keep. Her voice is husky from one cigarette too many. Her makeup is layered and her eyes are shadowed and she puts one hand on her hip and uses the other hand to hold a dirty martini with three olives. (laughs) Sorry, boys, she says. We're booked for the night. We're not here for that, the captain says. We're here for the Hebrews. The Hebrews. You sure you're not here for a little bit of fun? And she winks a heavy eyelash at the youngest soldier, and he blushes. But the captain stays focused. We came for the spies. Where are they? She steps out on the porch, and she closes the door behind her, and she looks to the right, and she looks to the left, and she motions for the soldiers to lean in, and she lowers her voice to a whisper, and she says, you just missed them. They just snuck out before the gates were closed. But if you take off, you can catch them. Take off, they do. And as soon as they disappear around the corner, Rahab turns and she opens the door and she scurries up the stairs of the brothel to the top where the two spies are hiding. The coast is clear, she tells them. And she gestures over the city wall at that disappearing group of soldiers and their lit torches. And she says, now's your chance to get out. We're tempted to dash down a trail or two ourselves here, aren't we? And talk about why in the world those men were hanging out in a brothel to begin with. I'm not going there. Why did Rahab lie and what does that say about our own ethics? We'll save that one too. I think the bigger question right here is Rahab herself. And what does the appearance of a harlot taking up the entirety of the second chapter early in the book of Joshua have to say to us about our own promised land? Well, the answers appear as we begin to look at Rahab's response and her commentary, what she says to the soldiers before they slip out. I'm reading now from the LPV. It's the Locato paraphrase version. (laughs) She said to the soldiers, the whole city is talking about you and your armies. Everybody is freaking out. The king cannot sleep. The people cannot eat. They're popping Xanax like candy. The last ounce of courage left on the morning train. 
Their words must have stunned the spies. They never expected to find cowards in Jericho. (laughs) Even more, they never expected to find faith in a brothel, but they did. Now I'm reading from the Bible. Rahab said to them, I know that the Lord your God has given you the land. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea and what you did to the two kings who were on the other side of the Jordan, the Lord your God. He is God in heaven. And on earth beneath. (laughs) Just never know where you're going to find faith, do you? Her morals may have been questionable, but she, she could do the math. And her logic was spot on. She said, I've been watching. I've been paying attention. And the best I can tell, your God is the one calling the shots. And Rahab found God. And God found Rahab. He spotted this tender heart in this hard city and he reached out to touch her. He would have done the same for the entire city, but no one else asked him. Rahab, I think, had an advantage over the other people. You see, she didn't have anything to lose. She was at the bottom of the rung. She was at the end of the rope. She'd already lost her reputation, her social standing, her chance for advancement. In the clearest view is always from the bottom of the pit. And that's where Rahab was, and perhaps that's where you are. Rahab was surrounded by evil. Maybe you are too. Rahab was encircled by violence. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you're in a home where everyone argues and fights. Maybe you're in a business where backbiting is an art form. Maybe you're in a school where no one cares. Maybe you're in a neighborhood where the only time you hear about God is in a curse word. Maybe you know what it's like to live in Jericho. Maybe you know what it's like to go the ways of a Rahab. You may or may not sell your body but you've sold your allegiance, your affection, your attention, your talents. You've sold out. At one time or another, we have all sold out. And we've not even met our own expectations of ourselves. And we've wondered, does God have a place for someone like me? And we hear messages about promised land and glory days, and we think that's fine and good for them, for him, for her, but not for me. We tell ourselves, I've gone too far, I've I've sinned too much, I've wandered away for too long. I'm on the garbage heap of society, There's, there's no glory days for me. And God has a one word response to that reluctance the name Rahab Rahab's proclamation to us God has a place for you just when you start to self-eliminate just when you begin to let your past disqualify you you turn the page on the book of Joshua and you read the story about Rahab Fascinating, don't you think, that the narrator gives her an entire chapter. We don't even know the name of Joshua's right-hand man. The priest who will carry the ark across the Jordan River, who knows? She gets a whole chapter, second chapter. She's on front page of the paper. Headline news. God picked Rahab. If scriptural quantity and scriptural chronology have anything to do with theology, we're getting a big dose of grace here in chapter 2. And that is to say, if you're wanting to go into the promised land, don't you think for a second that your past is greater than God's grace? 
Jesus' self-assigned job description was this. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. Now, when you and I use the word lost, we talk about, oh, I've lost my keys. Or, I've lost my dog. I've lost my mind. <laughs> but when Jesus used the word here, he used a word that means ruined or destitute, on the garbage heap, tossed out, discarded. Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was trash. That's the person I came for, God says. As evidence, we have stories like Rahab. As evidence, we have stories like that of the Samaritan woman in the New Testament. She was, wasn't she, the New Testament counterpart to Rahab? By the time Jesus met her, she was a first century version of a downward spiral. Five ex-husbands. Five ex-husbands. Half a dozen kids, each one looking like a different daddy. Decades of loose living had left her tattooed and tabooed. Living with a boyfriend who thought a wedding was a waste of time. She was a sitting duck for the town gossip. Maybe that's why she enjoyed going to the well in the middle of the day when most of the women would go early in the morning. The scorn of the heat was worse than the heat of the sun. Would it, were it not for the appearance of the stranger that day, we, we would have never heard her story. She would have just been lost in the Samaritan sands, but this stranger came, Jesus came into her world, and he began talking to her about this endless supply of water and this ability to have your thirst quenched once and for all. And she, I guess like Rahab, had tried everything else. And so she was willing to take a chance. And she tossed her hat in the ring with him. And we know because of what happened next. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I did. And when they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. And so he stayed for two days. Long enough for many of them to hear his message and believe. And they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. And now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. <laughs> First missionary to be sent out by Jesus. Not Peter, not Paul, not John. A woman whose name we're never told but whose story we are. A modern day in her day, Rahab, who chose to believe. Jesus gave her the chance of a lifetime when no one else even gave her a chance. He came for her. He came for people like Rahab. The Hebrew spies, as it turns out, were actually missionaries too. You know, since we know what happened to the city of Jericho, we know that whatever information that the spies collected proved needless because it was not the information or the data that the spies brought back to Joshua that caused the city to collapse. God did that. He didn't need their data. He didn't send them there. They may have thought they went there to collect information, but really they were sent there to reach Rahab. What a picture of God. He came to seek and to save, to seek and to save. And so the two spies told Rahab how to be saved. They said, bind a line of scarlet cord in the window. Remember her brothel abutted the wall and so she did without hesitation she bound the scarlet cord in the window and she hung it out and there it hung until the day Joshua and his soldiers came and they were told to keep an eye out 
for that scarlet cord. They escaped, the spies did. Rahab made her preparation. She told her family to get ready. She tied that rope, that scarlet rope, that cord, and hung it out her window. And don't you bet your sweet September that she double-checked it two or three times a day to make sure it was still there. And when the Hebrews came and the walls fell, when everyone else perished, Rahab and her family were spared. Her story became a part of Hebrew lore. Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. So she dwells in Israel to this day. Hmm. As if the narrator was saying to the first readers of this story, you can go meet her if you want. She'll tell you what happened. And she'll tell you that all she did was believe. She had faith. She didn't know much about God. A hunch is she'd never heard of Moses. I don't have high expectations that she had ever memorized the Ten Commandments. She'd sure never heard all of the Torah, but what she had heard of God, she believed, and that was enough. She believed what she had seen. The Scripture says, By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish. In the end, it was her profession of faith and not her profession in Jericho that made the difference. Maybe your past is a checkered one. Maybe all your life, your failures have been spoken in the same sentence with your name. Maybe your pedigree is one of violence. Your ancestry is one of rebellion. Your heritage is one of disbelief. And you've wondered, does God have a place for someone like me? The story of Rahab is in the Bible for you. It's for you. Take refuge in God. Follow her example. Put your faith in. Put your faith in a living God, a living, loving God. We don't dangle scarlet cords out the window, but we do trust in the crimson thread of the blood of Jesus Christ that spilled from his heart as he hung on the cross. We don't prepare for the coming of the Hebrews, but we do live with an eye toward the east, anticipating the the arrival of our Joshua, Jesus Christ. And just as the walls of Jericho were demolished, so this version of this world will be demolished and it will be restored to the way it was intended to be. And someday our mess will become our music and our bad chapters will become stories of grace and we'll take our place in that heavenly symphony. You'll play your instrument and I'll play mine. And one thing's for sure, we'll all know amazing grace by heart. Thank you, Father, for stories of grace that find their way in the most unlikely places. But here we are, Father, the most unlikely of your children, seeking you, wanting to know you, and worshiping you. We come today not with boast of accomplishments of our own, but depending upon the accomplishment of Christ. Thank you, Father. We receive anew the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life. Through Jesus we pray. And all the church said, Amen.